How are you? Well, that song that we just sang was based on the famous song, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace is amazing. One of the reasons is the person who composed that song for the most of his life gave anything but grace. I mean, he was renowned. John Newton, known for being crude, being uh, 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 cruel. He was a slave trader. He had, and people knew him as just a, a guy who was, who was uh, uh, trading slaves. He, was, he, was, he did despicable things. And that was until one night when he was on a, in, in, on a boat. And he was in a storm and he was almost thrown overboard. It was terrible. And he cried out to God to save him and God spared his life. Soon after that, he gave up the vocation of slave trading, became a minister and joined William Wilberforce in his fight against the slave trading industry. But he never lost sight of the fact that he was this, this person who had come from such depths. And he was so, so, so wretched. And, and even as a believer, he made, he, he, he made slow changes. I mean, he made some big changes, but he also still had a lot of struggles in his life. Today, by, you know, people would certainly call, call uh, the writer of Amazing Grace a hypocrite by today's cynical standards of post-Christianity. But he was just aware of, he really was just a wretch saved by grace. Many historians believe that his song was an old slave song that he redeemed, rewrote it, just like he himself was redeemed. When he, his, his life is a story of, of, of redemption. And, and the Apostle Paul picks up a similar kind of theme when he reflects on his life. Very, very direct. He says, notice at the top of your outline, 1 Timothy, he says, Apostle Paul is talking very bluntly. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. He has given me the strength for my work because he knew that he could trust me. I used to say terrible and insulting things about Jesus, and I was cruel. But he had mercy on me because I didn't know what I was doing. And I had not yet put my faith in him. And our Lord poured out his abundant grace on me. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I was the worst sinner of all. So Paul says, hey, listen. And he wrote most of the New Testament. He goes, listen, I came from a terrible background. Look at all the things I did and, and wicked, nasty, bad, all these things. But he, said, he points to Christ. He goes, but... In Christ, I'm, God's creating something new. He's, he's redeeming me. He's making me uh, more like him. Now, if you read the, the, the New Testament, you see that Paul certainly wasn't perfect either, even as a Christ follower. How do you rectify that? It's being a Christ follower, being someone who's put their fight, faith in Christ, and yet you still have these, you wrestle with things. You know, you wrestle with sin and things you're not proud of. And how does that all work? Well, you, you know, it's, it is kind of odd. I, I thought of this uh, illustration that I was reading about this Harvard biologist, Edward O. Wilson. He did this bizarre experiment where he was, he was into ants. And so he, he studied ants quite a bit. And he noticed that when an ant would die in its little nest colony, the ants ignored that ant, the, 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 the ant that died for several days before the, they would walk around their little crumpled friend. And then eventually they'd notice he was dead and he would, they would drag him out to the ant cemetery. And so he came to the conclusion that it was not by visual sight, but by smell that in the, as the ant decomposed. And so as he started uh, trying to isolate the different chemicals, he came to the conclusion, he, he, he discovered it was oh, this chemical oleic acid and that it was, it was instinctively hardwired into the ants. So much so when he would put just some oleic acid on a piece of paper and then put it in the nest colony, the ants would immediately grab the piece of paper, drag the piece of paper out and put it in with the rest of the dead ants in the ant cemetery. So in this kind of crazy twist at the end. He thought, I wonder what happens if I put some oleic acid chemical on a live ant. 
And so he did. He put it on a live ant, would put it in the middle of the nest colony, just as expected. All these ants would come around, this ant dragging it. It's in protest with its little legs and its antennae trying to communicate, I'm alive. They would drag this live ant into the ant cemetery. He'd try to come back. They wouldn't let him back in until he could clean himself off. He'd get all of the, this oleic acid off, and then he was allowed back into the cemetery. I mean, back into the nest. So th- this is kind of how it is as a Christ follower, as Christians, God's wanting to clean us off. And we don't really, we have a hard time belonging in what God's doing when we've got this stuff on. But, and so sometimes we're kind of in the middle of this thing. It can be quite confusing. That's why grace is so profound. See, the grace of God comes, it's not just the way into Christianity, which it is. It's the way on. It's, it's, it's how we see ourselves and how we see God and how we treat others. It affects everything about us when we start to discover God's amazing grace. But it does begin with us first seeing where we came from. If we play games with that and say, well, it's really not that bad and I'm not, I've never murdered somebody and I've never done this and I'm better than the average person, and then we, don't, we never really walk into God's grace. God's grace is manifested greatest when we are honest about who we are and our short failings before a holy God and before our, even our own expectations, much less God's. So that's why God's grace is so, so important. And, so, and, and you see that happening, reverberating throughout Scripture, this idea of God's grace. Titus, he, uh, Paul says there, he says, it is the grace of God that teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to lead self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. You see, it's through grace, how we view our past failures, that changes the way we move into our future. So today what I want to do is celebrate communion. We're going to do that in just a moment with, uh, within our, with, right here. Because as we do that, I think communion represents the grace of God in a very, very full way. So if the, you can start passing it out because it takes a little bit of time and, as, as we celebrate communion. But I want you to listen to this about, commun- about grace. You, you really don't understand grace. If you worry that your day may not go well because you missed your morning prayer, your morning devotions, you don't understand grace. If you feel sheepish about asking for him something that, that you think that God doesn't want to give you, you know, because you've just blown it. Or, or if you think that 1 John 1, 9 doesn't apply to you anymore. Because 1 John 1, 9 says that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, I've done that so many times, he's got to be tired of me. That's a lack of understanding about grace. You un- don't understand grace if you live with a vague sense of his disapproval. Or you shy away from asking him things because you think it annoys him. So for all the talk about grace, a lot of times we don't really, we don't really take the time to soak in that and think about God's grace in our lives. Now, how do we get God's grace? How do you get it? Is it by doing 14 steps or six pillars or different, you know, things that you do, certain rituals? No, it's simple. You receive God's grace through trusting Christ, by trusting Christ. Now, I know you're holding stuff, so you can write that in later. (laughs) But it's by trusting Christ. It's that simple. Something that Jesus says, it's not, it's, it's, that's all it is, is when we put our faith in Christ, something a child can understand, certainly. John 1, 17 says, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It's all wrapped up in one person, grace and truth. And so when we, what, what communion is about is celebrating what Christ did on the cross. When we recognize Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross for me. Thank you. Okay. And uh, it, it tells us, Christ cared for us. And, and Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So what we remember is, is Christ died for me because I was a sinner. I needed his, I, I was, I needed, God's grace covered me. And God also empowers me. And so when we take communion, now here at the vineyard, we, have, we believe in uh, the open table is what we call it. In, in other words, we allow everybody to be, there's some denominations where if you're not a member of that church or a member of that denomination, you can't participate. We believe in an open table 
We see that in Scripture. And what it is, is this, this, is, uh, this is grape juice, not wine. You know, the church used wine for years, and then about 150 years ago, a guy named Welch, we, which we get Welch's grape, grape juice from, he was a Baptist uh, man, a businessman in, in his church, and he noticed a lot of the people that were, ex-alcohol, were alcoholics and, you know, ex-drinkers couldn't participate in communion. He thought, well, that's a shame. And so he, he discovered how to, uh, by, by, in the fermentation process happens when the skin is mixed in with the juice. And so he just removed the skin and made grape juice. But it was, grape juice was a creation for communion. That's, how, that's, that's, why, we, that's why we do grape juice today instead of wine. So, you know, it's the same kind of thing, right? And, uh, and then we use crackers because that's unleavened bread, which is what the, um, uh, the Passover would have, would have had involved in it, reflecting back to Moses. And, and so these two kind of go together, re- representing Jesus' body that was broken, this unleavened bread, bread that him dying for our sins, and then also this, this, uh, this wine that says, the, God gives me new life. I have, I have victory in Christ. And so when we take it, today as you take it, if you're a believer, you're remembering what Christ did for you. You're remembering the grace of God. If you're, if you're not sure, or you've never put your faith in Christ, this, this would be an opportunity to do that. To say, as I take this, this bread and this, this unfermented wine, I'm putting my trust in God because I need his grace. And so, okay, so let's, let's pray together and then we'll take communion together. Heavenly Father, as we take these, these elements, these symbols, we're receiving afresh the grace of Christ. Not because these are special, these are a remembrance, but it's, but it's by our trusting in Christ, trusting Jesus, that gives us peace with you, gives us a promise of our future. And so we, as we take that, we, we say yes to you, Jesus. Why don't you take it with me? Eat the bread. And then when you're ready, drink the cup. It's a powerful, a powerful thing, communion is, to remember what Christ does for us. That's why I wanted to do it. To remember what Christ, to remember his grace, that's the way in. They're going to collect the cups, but you can go ahead and pull out your outline and And look at this next verse. It says, now we rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God. All because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in dying for our sins, making us friends with God. You know, some people have friends in high places. That's friends in high places. He says, we're friends with God. You can't get any higher than that. A relationship with Christ. That's what gives us our friendship with God. It's not through obeying certain rules, going, you know, working hard. There's something that almost, when we talk about the grace of God, it almost goes counter to what we want. It's kind of like, uh, it's a good deal if you're messed up. If you've done a lot of screwy things, you're kind of like, hey, grace is the only way I had an option, right? But if you worked hard, you were a moral person, you, then it kind of feels unfair, right? You worked so hard and then you, you, you get the same thing that the losers get, right? I mean, in our society, when we think, you know, it's, 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 we earn our way and we work hard and God values all of that. And if we get enough credit, that means something. And it just feels like it's kind of wrong. Almost like, you know, if you worked all day in a, in a field and you were promised a certain amount of money and then somebody comes in at the last minute, you know, it's at the last hour and he gets paid the same thing. Wouldn't that irritate you? I mean, that's, that's kind of, but that's the grace of God. Jesus actually gives that illustration. He says that's, that describes the grace of God. When, when we have worked hard and we've, we've stewarded our lives well and manage things well and we're a good parent and we good son and a good daughter and and then somebody else who who didn't do that stuff and they they get treated with the same kind of good 
kind treatment from God. It's just like, I don't know, it just doesn't, it just feels wrong. But that's what grace is about. And that's what distinguishes it from other, other religions and belief systems all over the world that are based on that. Grace is unique to Christianity. It's because it's the grace of God. Because it, it's kind of, it, it, it irritates so many people that are hoping it's on a merit system. And they've been working hard at that. But grace says, no, actually, everybody is equal. Every, no matter where they come from. And part of the problem is we don't really understand. We don't really get it how our sin offends God. For most of us, we think, well, you know, you know, he's, I'm sure he's up to his neck and all these other people. I can't be that bad. But the truth is, the Bible says that all of that stuff keeps us from God because he's, he's holy. And so it's through grace. Recognizing like John Newton did. Well, you may not be a slave trader, but you recognize I, my ways outside of God are offensive to him. And it's only through this relationship with Christ that I can be made, that I can be made whole. And so we celebrate communion with that in mind. Here's what happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus hung on the cross. Number one, you can write this on your outline. He paid the penalty for our sin. He paid the penalty for our sin. It says, it is true that through the sin of one man, talking about Adam, death began to rule because of that one man. But how much greater is the result of what was done by one man, Jesus Christ? All who receive God's abundant grace are freely put right with him, will rule in life with Christ. So then, as the one sin condemned all people, in the same way, one righteous act sets all people free and gives them life. And so he says, the penalty of my sin has been taken care of. That's been resolved on the cross. There's nothing I can do to add to it. It's not about what I can do. For God, it's what's been done for me through Christ. And then the second thing is, is he broke the power of sin. He broke the power of sin. Notice this verse, it says, We know that death no longer has any power over Christ. When Christ died, he died for sin once and for all. But now he is alive and he lives only for God. In the same way, you must think of yourselves as dead to the power of sin. So underline that. In the same way. He says, just as Christ broke the power of sin over, uh, just he, as he rose from the dead, he broke the power of death and sin. He goes, we have the same, we're going to, we have the same way to walk into victory through the power of Christ, which I'm thankful for. Colossians 2.15, God stripped the spiritual rulers and powers of their authority with the cross. He won the victory and showed the world that they were powerless so Jesus gives us power. A lot of our power, honestly, just comes through prayer. And so the enemy likes it when we don't pray. When we just kind of skimp through prayer. You know, just pray over our food, you know. Like, that's, like that takes a lot of faith. Well, actually, this day, it probably does take a lot of faith to pray over some of the food, right? Lord, bless us to the nourishment of our bodies, glistening with all that stuff. <laughs> but it's through prayer that we really gain this power. If I were to tell you, it's beyond the scope of what I can talk about today, but if I were to tell you all the times that I have experienced God's power in my life, everything that comes to mind has to do with an answer to prayer. God, but, I, but, I, but I pray aggressively. I pray like I have authority. Not sheepishly, like, well, you know, if you're not too busy, and it's not too big of an issue for you, and no, I step into it because I, I recognize God gave me this authority. There's, a, there's this victory that, that comes that breaks the power of sin that allows me to have, see God change the world around me. Sometimes it affects me directly. Sometimes it doesn't. That's okay. So we, part of recognizing what Christ did on the cross fully is, is, is when we answer that with prayer. We start to pray more. We start to pray uh, uh, with confidence. What should be our response when we think of what Christ did on the cross? Should it be guilt? I've just done so much. And I mean, I'm glad he died for me because I am so guilty. Well, yeah, there's, 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 there's guilt, but that's resolved in the cross. That, that happens, that, that helps bring us to the cross. So when we do communion, we don't, we're not filled with guilt. 
You know, we don't have to be, be all laden down that. No, we, we have gratitude. Thank you, God. Thank you for what you've done for me. That you provided a way. And that I was willing, I had the faith, and I was willing to step into that. So what I want to do is um, say, what should be our response? I want to just close with that. What, what should our response be to God's grace, right? God gives us this grace. We understand how forgiving, how loving he is. Do we just do whatever we want? Because he'll forgive us? His grace is big enough to forget. You know, he's just so gracious. We'll just live our life how we want. Well, Paul, there's people even in the New Testament days were tempted to have that approach. And so he speaks out. He says this. He goes, so we beg you. Hear their urgency in that? Because we beg you. Do not let the grace you receive from God be for nothing. So what do I owe him? Well, I owe him the rest of my life. I owe my past, my present, my future. I, I'm to live for God. Now, let me give you three ways that you can express gratitude for God's grace in your life. Number one, I can express gratitude for God's grace in my life by making my life count. By making my life count. 1 Corinthians 6, 20 in the message says, don't you see that you can't keep on living however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? So let people see God in you, in and through your body. So he says, you can't just live. Once you discover God's grace, you don't just live however you want. Your time doesn't just belong to you. It belongs to God so you don't squander your time. That's what the world does. They just squander the time however they want to. Well, we, we, we have... We're living in the light of grace. So we don't just spend our money however we want to. We don't just spend our, our, our talents and our gifts however we want to. We, we have this renewed sense of Christ did something significant. That grace came with a price. President Reagan, when they, after his failed uh, assassination attempt on him, he said, um, he goes, ever since that assassination attempt, he goes, I have a sense of that my life counts for something and that God wants me to, every day I'm supposed to live for God in some way. And there's some truth to that. If you've ever had a, like a near, a near death experience, I've had, I've had a few. I, I, I listed six when I was thinking about it. I was thinking, well, I had that one and that one. And, uh, I'll just tell you a couple of them. One of them, I was a younger, I was, I was a young guy. I think I was about six or seven. And I was with my mom. We were flying into Chicago and we were on one of the big commercial airline jets, the wheels would not come out. Well, that's a problem, right? So we went, flew over Lake Michigan, dumped all the jet fuel out into the, into the water, and then as we were coming in, you could see they had put some kind of foam all over the runway. They had lined both sides of the runway with, with emergency vehicles, uh, you know, fire trucks, EMT, all that, and then they had us the pilot told us, hey, if you pray, if you want to pray, this is a good time. And, <laughs> and then we all, we were all instructed to put our heads in our laps and, you know, and we made it. So, but to me, that was, that was a scary moment. And when you think of those things, you think, wow, that was, could have all ended right there. And there was, I was in a, in a car with a drunk driver driving. He was driving 110 miles an hour and he's flying through traffic and we ended up in a terrible accident. I ended up with glass all on my back from the windshield. Something could, uh, a sign flew in through the windshield. That was very close. I, and there was another time I was snorkeling in a, in a, in a little cove called Dead Man's Reef. Now, it should have told me something. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up, I was by myself and I ended up surrounded with, with a, about 70, 80 great barracuda that were aggressive. They were like, they wouldn't let me out. I was trying to swim at them and they would just close. I thought, man, I'm going down. I'm going to be, I'm going to be food for these fish. And, and I prayed and it's kind of a story on its own. How I, but anyways, I ended up living. Each one of those, I, I, I came out of it going, you know what? I, I feel like I'm supposed to do something with my life. You know, you have that near miss. You think I was spared for a reason, kind of like John Newton did. And whether you had one of those experiences or not, Jesus died for you for you to live 
the life of meaning that he's called, he, he wants you to live. And maybe it wasn't you, but it was Christ, which is actually more and more significant anyways. Christ died so that you could live a life that he meant you to live. That's part of understanding grace. It's part of expressing gratitude for the grace that God gives us. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. And so the abilities, the talents, the education, the resources, the degree, the freedom, the relationships, all of those things that we have, we're to, be, we're to use not just to serve ourselves, he says, to serve others. It's part of the way we express our gratitude. We serve God, we serve others. So he died for us to make our lives count. Number two is we can express our gratitude by becoming a generous person. Second Corinthians 8, 9 says, You are familiar with the generosity of Jesus Christ, rich as he was. He gave it all away in one stroke. He became poor and we became rich. So how do we measure our understanding of grace? Well, some of that comes from our understanding of, we, we demonstrate that when we're generous. When we give our lives away like Christ did, that's what it means to be Christ-like. To be like Christ is Christ demonstrated his life in, in loving, serving, and giving. Those three words summarize the, what, the mission of Christ, what Jesus, how he lived his life. Loving, serving, and giving. And so when we do that, we are, we're, we're under, that shows that we understand God's grace in our lives. The Bible says, each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace, circle that, all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You circle all the, all the alls. He says, all grace, all things, at all times, having all that you need. And that promise is related to people that are, that are Christ followers, that are trusting Christ with their life. He says, when you trust God with all those things, he's going to protect you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to help you out. So one of the demonstrations that we understand grace is that we're generous. If, if when a pastor starts talking about generosity, you get nervous, you get defensive, you get stingy, all that does is just show that you don't understand God's grace. When we understand God's grace, we realize, oh, when I, I can't outgive God, when I trust God with my life, when I trust him with my finances, when I trust him with my relationships, whenever, whatever I want God to bless, I put him first in those areas, he's gonna, he's gonna show up. I'm gonna have his divine intervention in my life. So prayer is important, very important, but it's also being a generous person, recognizing that God wants me to be generous with my time, with my resources, with my, with my talents, the things that God's entrusted me with. Being generous. Notice this last verse, Romans uh, 8.32 says, since God loved us, enough to give us his own son, won't he love us enough to take care of every one of our other needs? You see what, what he's saying is he's saying, if we trust God with our soul, with our eternity, that God's going to, I know that when I die, God's going to be there. He's going to take care of my eternity. Certainly we can trust him with, you know, the 60, 70, 80 years that we're here on this planet, 90 years. And recognizing also that everything that we have is just on loan. We tend to think it's ours. But the truth is, it's on loan to us. It was here before we got here. It's going to be here after we leave. It's on loan. And, God, and it's really a test of stewardship, of faithfulness, of our generosity. It's, a, it's, it's do, do, are you going to express your gratitude for the grace of God? And we get that opportunity. And when we understand grace, we take that opportunity. Number three, we... Share the good news of grace. That's another way to be, to demonstrate our, our gratitude. That we share it with others. Let's read this verse together out loud. Ready? The most important thing is that I have a successful career. <laughs> well, that's what mine says. No, not mine. No, it doesn't say that. But some people would say that. Right? The most important thing is what? Let's read it together. Complete my mission. 
the work that the Lord Jesus gave me to tell people the good news about grace. So it doesn't say that the most important thing is that I get married. The most important thing is that I pay off my home and I have a good retirement account. It doesn't say the most important thing is, is that I have a great career and that I can go on great, I can travel a lot and, and, and have a lot of fun. No, it says the most important thing is that I do my mission. And part of my mission, not all of my mission, but part of my mission is sharing the good news about God's grace. That's how you discovered God's grace. You, somebody shared it with you. And that's the way it's communicated. That's the way God's done. He could come up with other ways, but he wants it through, through us. We share it with somebody. My brother shared God's grace with me. I shared it with other people. That's how, that's how we do it. We, and that's part of our mission. It's part of what God wants us to do. There's a lot of people who don't know that. Wouldn't you want to know if somebody died for you? Wouldn't you want to know about that? Hey, by the way, so-and-so died for you. <laughs> I'd want to know that. And there's a lot of people in Hampton Roads and beyond, all throughout the world, Mazalan, the places we go, that don't know that Jesus Christ died for them. That's, that They don't understand that, they, that their, their past can be forgiven, that they can have power for living today, that they can have hope for their future, that they can, they, they don't have to just live in the rut of the generational sins that are passed down. They don't have to be, just continue on with the habits and the hangups and all the things that they endure and live with. God's power, his victory comes in. They don't know that though, unless somebody tells them. Now let me ask you a serious question. Who will be in heaven because of you? I mean, when you, if you were to die today and you go to heaven, who, would there be anybody who comes up and says, thank you, I'm here because you shared Jesus Christ and his grace about it. I'm, I'm, you shared that with me. You, you, it was inconvenient. It was hard. Maybe you, maybe you were afraid, but you did it. Everybody should, you want that. You want that. If you don't have that, you should be praying towards that. Say, God, show me who I can share my faith with, who I can tell about the good news of God's grace with. So that when you get into heaven, that's what I'm hoping for. When I go to heaven, I want, I hope lots of people come up and say, I am here because of you, Andy. You could have done a lot of different things with your life. You could have, there was a lot of times that it was inconvenient for you to share. Because actually, a lot of the people I've shared, I do way more sharing with my, of my faith individually than I do on the weekends. Individually, in, in just meetings over the years, it just because it just comes up so much. I mean, obviously it's, it's here as well, but actually a lot of the people that come to Christ here are because you invited them. You invited them and other people have already been talking to them. They just come and then they just, they, they, it makes sense to them, you know, maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time or just a different way and they put two and two together. But, but most of, that's why these, like when Billy Graham or Franklin Graham comes into an area and, and shares, they start that two years out because most of what happens in somebody's spiritual life happens during that two years, not in that one moment. And so it happens because we share one-on-one, -on -one, we share, let me tell you about God's grace. For I worked at Costco for 10 years, at nine and a half years. I rounded off to 10. Get, getting, I worked my way through college, through seminary at Costco. And, and there was many times I'd work night shifts and I'd just be around a pallet cutting open some boxes with another guy and he'd start sharing his life a little bit and I'd talk to him about God's grace. And just right there, I'd say, why don't we just put our cutters down and, our, and just for a moment, let's just bow our heads and just pray and just ask, you know, just ask God for you know, intervention in your life right there and then. Many times just people just came to Christ right there over a box of M&Ms, you know? Doesn't seem overly like, you know, it's not, a, it's not an, a church. It's just right there in their place in their life. And we share, we, but we got to be faithful. We got to be saying, I'm not going to shy away from that. You know, I knew the rules. Do you think it was, it was that I could look in the, in the Costco's policy manual and say, oh yeah, I'm allowed to do that. No, right? But I, I remember my mission, my mission, don't forget yourself in God's story. So many times we think it's our story. The next time you're at a place where you're thinking, should I invite him to church? Should I share about Christ? Should I talk, should I invite and say, could I pray for you over that, that you just shared that, that area, that, that physical illness or whatever, instead of getting all, well, what if they're not healed? Don't, don't let all that, just say, God, I don't want to forget my place in your story. 
And then step into that and say, let me take a chance and see what God does. Okay? Let's bow our heads and pray. Well, as we just take a moment, we're just going to ask for God's, God's anointing, his blessing over this moment of prayer. Prayer changes lives. Prayer changes circumstances. We never want to take that for granted. Whether it's individual prayer, in this case, it's corporate prayer. Some of you may need to confess something. Maybe some ingratitude about God's grace in your life. You might need to say something like this. Say, Jesus, please forgive me for taking your grace for granted. You may need to confess a fear. You say, Father, I've been afraid to make my life count for you. Or, Father, I've been afraid to use my abilities. You've given me to serve you and to serve others. Or maybe you pray, I've been afraid to tithe, to put you first in my finances. I get all worried about my bills and my debts and things going on in my life. And maybe you'd say, God, I've been afraid to identify, identify myself as a follower of you at school or at work. I've lost my place in your story. You don't let guilt take you now. This is the place where grace comes. You say, God, forgive me and I accept your grace. I accept your grace. Would you, I invite you to pr just follow me in this prayer. Say, Father, I want to make my life count for you. I want to commit the rest of my life to using the life you gave me in serving you and other people. Using my life to fulfill the purpose you made me for. To fulfill my mission. Would you say, God, I want to become a generous person starting with tithing back to you in gratitude for all you've done. I'm going to trust you with my finances. And then say, God, I want to be used in sharing the good news of your grace. Help me to find at least one person who I can share my story with. Lord, I thank you for those who are maybe understanding grace for the first time. Let your grace change their life like it's done so many other people over the years and in this room. This morning, would you just reaffirm that to God? Just say, God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for loving me enough to die for me. I give you permission to start to change that, those condemning voices that try to tear me down. Help me to see, see myself as you see me. Fearfully and wonderfully made. In Jesus' name, amen.